Yeah, cool. Uh, so this session is the future of accessibility. This is the single point if you're in the wrong room to leave. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm Ashley. I'm going to start by talking about what we're going to do, and then I'll tell you about who I am. So. There we go. Right, uh, this is what I think I've put in the PowerPoint. Uh, so it's what is accessibility? We're going to talk a little about what guidelines are, what guidelines are out there. I'm then going to do a very soft switch into what is happening in the research side of the world. Um, and then I'm going to talk about two different research approaches and methodologies about how we do accessibility research. Um, they are responsible research and design, no, nope, responsible research and innovation and participatory research or design. But I will explain more about what those are later. So first, who am I? Uh, my name is Ashley Graham Brown. My pronouns are they, them, and I am a PhD researcher at the EPSRC Horizon Center for Doctoral Training. Um, my funding is on the bottom of that slide, so if you want to find out how I get paid, that is how. Um, on here are two links. The one on the far left is my feedback. This slide will appear again at the end. The one on the right is uh, my link tree. So if you want to find me and find out what I'm doing, it's all there. But this slide will be back, so don't worry about it. But do please get out your phones to join in for a mentee. So you've got three questions, that's all. There's not a lot of questions. There's not a lot of interaction. Um, but this just hopefully means that if there's anyone online, they can also access it and see what we're doing. All right. Beautiful. First question, what is accessibility? Add your responses and talk amongst yourselves. Yeah, so the responses all kind of agree with each other, which is quite nice. Um, it is about everyone being able to use everything. Um, yep, so some reference to disability in there, making things easy to use. I can still pe see people still typing, <laughs> so I will give it another minute. So yeah, that is a general I think you've got a lot of the points of accessibility. It's about being able to use things, being able to do things, and it not mattering who you are. Um, what I'm going to very quickly do, oh, there's another response that just come in. Yeah, being able, yeah, being able to get the best out of things. Is I'm going to hopefully very quickly jump back to my slides for a second. You're going to jump back to where I want. And I have a very long academic definition of accessible technology. Um, which is accessible technology refers to using different or modified input or output approaches to access the same information, the same web content, the same applications, and the same ebooks as those used by people without disabilities. So it's got that use in it, it's got that um, making sure anyone can access things. This is a very particular definition from a book. Uh, if you see references on my slide, the full references are in the notes. These slides are available later. I don't think they're available at the moment, but they will be available later. So we have another question, which will appear on Menti in a minute, which is, who does accessibility help? So let me flip. There you go. Yeah. People have got the right answer. That's very good. <laughs> um, yeah. Shockingly, accessibility is for everyone. Uh, there is a thing called the drop curb effect. Uh, so drop curbs are most of the time put in to help cars get to driveways, right? We drop the curve, makes it very nice, cars can use a thing. Um, as a person who really doesn't like steps, I love dropped curves, and I will walk weirdly across roads to hit me drop curves. I have friends in wheelchairs, they use drop curves. Mothers in with pushchairs and prams, they use drop curves. So even if you're only deciding for one little group, it will end up helping a lot more people because you tend to make it more user-friendly. Did I put, oh, I did put a third thing, but that's fine. So, back to the slides. I really should not be loading it on that slide. So, there you go. The beautiful, wonderful, 
answer. Um, right, the other thing, so, not the other thing, moving on, we're gonna talk about some guidelines. Hopefully, most of you have at least heard of some accessibility guidelines. Maybe. I'm getting some very blank looks. Okay, cool. I won't do the next menti. So there was a menti question asking you about which ones you use, but by the look of the room, I'm gonna assume the answer is not many. So I'm just gonna talk to you about some instead. So here are three guidelines. Uh, these are all done by W3C. They do most of the web content guidelines and some others. Um, if you have heard of WCAG, which is the bottom one on there, which is the most common one people talk about, which is the web content accessibility guidelines, these are who do it. Um, so, from their website, roughly, um, for WCAG, web content generally refers to the information on a web page, application, uh, this can include text, this can include images, this can include sounds, videos, anything that you think you might find on a web page. Um, it also can include dynamic content, so content that changes, um, and some other bits. That's why WCAG often gets modified for use in apps. I've seen people modify WCAG guidelines for Power BI. Probably, if you work with any kind of visualization and somebody tells you they have a set of guidelines, it's WCAG modified in some way. Uh, the other two on there I think are very useful, but only if you work in back end. So authoring tools, accessibility guidelines, are about making sure disabled people can build the things. So it's how do we do uh, alternative things for coding and development. And so it's how do you make a HTML editor accessible. Is that kind of level? And then the user agents one in the middle is about browsers, browser extensions, media players, and all of that. Is there any questions on any of these? given all the blanklets I had a minute ago. This is all digital. So if you, go to f if you want physical accessibility, there's a whole bunch of new guidelines, um, but they tend to be slightly more ratified by the government at the moment. Same principles and research apply, um, but like they're older. So how steep a slope can be, that guideline's been around a lot longer, whereas a lot of this, we're still very much working it out, and it's not perfect. A lot of that, we know roughly how steep a wheelchair can go up. It's not changed very much. Any other questions? No, beautiful. Right. How do we make standards? Um, this is a bit where what I do comes in. So, uh, creating standards, there's kind of three different ways we do it. Uh, the main methods that I think should be used, and this is putting my personal bias into what I think research should be doing, is using participatory methods. Um, I'll go into them a bit more at the end, but it's about bringing people with lived experience to join researchers in making a thing. Um, it's not about them being researched, but almost them joining the research itself. Uh, user testing, which is very much what it sounds like, getting disabled people to try a thing and tell you where the problems are, but it tends to be less interactive between the researchers and the participants. And then personas. Um, personas can be and often is problematic. So that is where you create a fake identity of a fictional person and you think about how they would use your system, how they move through it, these are often based in stereotypes or can become stereotyped um, if they are not carefully created in the beginning. I know researchers that all they do is make personas and they spend years and years and years researching a group of people to come up with a rough persona to help people who don't have access to that community do the design, but ideally um, talk, talk to the people. So this is kind of an order of how I think best to worst, you should be doing it, but sometimes you'll have to pick a different method than the ones I'm showing. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the comment there was that personas 
uh, risk coming from your own perception still, not the perception of the lived experience. Um, I'm a sighted screen reader user. I still don't know how a blind person uses a website because I use, still use it very differently. Um, I have some ideas because I've spoken to a lot of blind people as part of my job, but I still wouldn't design for them without having them closer into the loop. Uh, but yeah, just be aware it exists and it has a place normally in very, very, very early design where you can't get or you don't have access to the right communities. Um, but please avoid it. <laughs> right, I'm going to talk a little about research. Um, this slide is here to remind me to talk to you about why we're talking about methodologies. Uh, so, in what we do in research, there's kind of three different kinds of outputs you can have. So, one of the things we're forever asked is, what is your contribution to academia? And um, what is your contribution to the real world? Um, I'm a human factors engineer and a, a human computer interaction specialist. So, I care a lot about my impact in the real world and apparently not enough about my impact to academia. Um, <laughs> But I was really hoping that I was going to find some really lovely research and some really lovely things to tell you about data visualization. I couldn't find any. I went looking for data visualization guidelines, and I can't find any. Uh, I will keep looking, and if they, if they will, it will appear either on my Twitter or on a blog when I do find some. I'll get very excited about it, uh, and I do keep tabs on it. But they are very few if there are any. Um, which is why I would direct you to a CAG, because they've got the best we've got at the moment. Um, so just be aware that there isn't a lot, and that's why we're going to talk about some methods, some approaches, rather than talk about actually the design and output side of it. Does that all make sense? Cool. Not lost anyone. Right. I'm going to talk first about responsible research and innovation. This is a branch of research that comes out of uh, researchers not being particularly ethical in many situations. Um, it's done as a separate branch of research to our ethics applications. So in research, we have to submit really long forms to say why we're doing what we're doing, what we're going to tell people we're doing, uh, and why that's an OK thing to do. And that gets sent off to other people, and they go, yeah, that looks fine. That looks like you're not going to cause massive trauma and really hurt the people you're working with. Uh, responsible research and innovation takes that one step further. It says, is the work I'm doing now, if it's not harming my participants, could it be harming the world in the future? Could it be making the world worse in the future? Could a bad actor come in and take my research and do something with it that I think is a really bad thing? So when we look at the definition of RRI, uh, it says, responsible research and innovation invites researchers and innovators to consider the bigger picture, including long-term impacts of their work and its value to society. Different definitions of RRI emphasize, uh, RRI emphasize different things, but they all highlight concerns that can be overlooked or undervalued even by good researchers. So my research is RRI research. When I look at accessibility, I do it from this lens. Um, this is currently a category of research. Um, there are a couple of places, if you want to learn a lot more about RRI than I have time to talk about, and in more depth than I know, uh, there are a couple of places I recommend. Um, so this comes from the TAS Hub website, which is the Trustworthy Autonomous Systems, uh, which is a UK-wide research group um, who do a lot of this work. There is also a website called rri-tools.eu that talks about RRI for business, which is probably very useful. <laughs> um, uh, the next slide I have borrowed from one of their decks. So, let it load. This, in RRI, we have six pillars. So this comes from rri-tools.eu. This is one of their slides. And these six pillars are what we aim to make better. They are what we think about and focus on. And they are what we hope to contribute um, towards. So making sure that what we do is more ethical. We think about how it could affect gender equality and how we can improve gender equality in our research groups. 
We think about uh, governance and the structural changes to make sure that RRI is in everything that we do. Um, open access means that anything that I publish or anything I research is available to anybody for free, forever. Um, a lot of research is behind paywalls. This is a massive problem. Uh, even inside universities, I can't access a ton of research. Um, so we're trying to make it available to the public. Um, and then the public engagement means that we then try and tell the public about our research. Um, and that's a bit of what I'm doing at the moment is to talk about it because that's, it means that my research can be applicable to a wider audience, but also means that I get other opinions about what I should be doing and what I could be doing back to me. Uh, and that can inform the way that I approach things in the future. And then it's also about science education. Uh, that last point mostly is talking about educating children and ensuring that we have a future generation of researchers to follow me. Um, yeah, so these are sometimes called the six keys, sometimes called the six pillars, sometimes called many other things. But if you search RRI and then six keys or six pillars, uh, you should find these and more about them. Is there any questions? Yes. Yeah, sometimes, so this is an EU directive. This is part of the Horizon EU research grants, which means that I didn't write what these are, and a whole bunch of people around me did not write what these are. I know inside Nottingham, I'm pretty sure when we talk about it, inside uh, the RRI groups there, we have flipped out gender equality for um, equality, diversity, and inclusion, but we don't have funding for that, right? The EU funding is for this. Uh, and is why I'm putting up as this, even though I think this is not necessarily the right option, um, is because it's what the funding's for. And I'm going to tell you what the funding's for, because if you, beyond in business, approach people who do responsible research and innovation, that is one of their keys. However, the other thing to notice in that gender equality symbol is it does include trans people explicitly because that is what the third um, arrow is, the arrow with the cross. It explicitly includes trans people. There are minorities not included here. Uh, it's a thing I think we're working on. I think though, part of it is one problem at a time. Um, and currently, so I'm in a very weird place in that my research group actually has a lot of women in it. But I know across the board, there are still awards out there for having a couple of, re a couple of female researchers near the top of your organization. And that's still seen as a really big thing to get to. So that's the, it's there because it's currently the biggest, well, it's currently one of the bigger problems. I am sure it will move on and it should move on and it should start looking at those other ones right now. But the funders do what the funders do and there's only so much I can, argue with them. Um, but yeah, the other way, so this is a slightly different approach to RRI. Um, and there is, in the, sl in the slide notes, um, the website for this is orbit-rri.org. Um, and they have a whole bunch of explanation of what all this is. So the Area 4P framework sits in a grid, and I know I have not displayed it very well here, and for that I apologize. But imagine area is down the side, and each of those four Ps is along the top, right? Um, and wh here, what you're thinking about is how you plan activities, design, and other kind of building things. So when we talk about anticipate, we talk about what might be, ha like the big overview, what could go wrong? Um, what could go right? And how could other people use our really good work to do some really bad things? Um, the next one in that is reflect. Uh, so this is on, you're looking at um, purposes, motivations, uh, and other implications of the research that don't quite come under anticipate. Engage is about talking to people, bringing people in in an inclusive way to get a whole bunch of other opinions on what you're thinking about doing. 
and how you, en how you engage with that and how you deal with that. And act is doing the thing that you said you want to do. Inside each of those, so every time we talk about anticipate, we talk about it under the four piece. So you're going to anticipate the process. How are you going to do it? How are you planning on doing it? Um, in there, we often talk about, in research, we talk about the methodologies we're going to use um, and how we're going to process this thing. When you, like, if you engage with the product, that might be some user testing. So how are you getting people in to talk about the product you want to make and how you build it? Uh, yeah, and so they kind of all cross intersect. This is this. There are a couple other resources for explaining this. Um, it's kind of complicated, but it's a big grid of things to think about and ways to approach what you're doing. Does does that make sense? Have I lost you? No. Wonderful. I got lost first time I looked at this. So. <laughs> And I, I had physical cards to play with, and I was like, oh, I, I don't get it. Um, and there's a thing just to kind of note that it's, I think for me, it's a way of approaching it and a way of understanding what you're doing. And occasionally, when you finish this process, what you get to is, I shouldn't do the thing. Actually, I shouldn't do my research. And that's a bit of a problem when you're paid to do research, and you're like, oh, this project isn't ethical. I can't do it. For us, that's still research. That actually still counts as an output to say, the thing I wanted to do is unethical. You can still publish that paper. It's a little bit harder for you when you are being paid to build a thing if you go, I don't think we can do this. Um, but I would invite you to work on that and to maybe sometimes say, no, I don't think we should be doing it. Um, but yeah, that is RRI. I want to last bit. What am I doing for time? A little bit fast. OK. Anyway, so participatory research and design. This is my main methodology. So RRI is an approach to research in the same way I'm actually, I do feminist methods. Feminism is an approach to my research. Um, this is actually practical. This is how I do what I do um, and is more on the ground. The aim of participatory research is that it engages those who are not necessarily trained in research, but belong to or represent the interests of people who are the focus of the research. Instead of subjects of traditional research, participatory research collaborates with stakeholders, community, constituents, and end users in the research process. In short, we blur the line between researcher and participant. So if we were doing participatory research, uh, it would be a way to invite any of you to stand on the stage and say what you think and rotate round. It would never just be just me speaking. This is very not what my research does. Um, if you want to see an example of co-design, uh, when I was here last year, we did a very brief overview, an example of what co-design can look like. Um, but also, I will talk a little bit about what that is on this slide. Sorry, as I used a word I haven't defined yet. Co-design. Uh, Co-design means that people come together to conceptually develop and create things that respond to certain matters of concern to create a better future reality. People come together despite or because of their different agendas, needs, knowledge, and skills. Co-design is a specific methodology inside the big umbrella of participatory research. So in when we do participatory research, that also can include things like us dreaming up a near future to talk about what sustainability might look like. It's about what if we lived in a world where, I don't know, really bad, didn't you? What if we lived in a world where everyone had sustainable clothing? What does that look like? What does that change about our actions day to day? Um, Co-design is a very different element of this. This is far more practical. So this is about if you are designing anything. So I do a lot of experience design. What I do is I invite people who currently can't do the experience because they just can't get through 
um, it's too noisy, it's too loud. It, for some reason, there's inaccessibility. And they come with me, and we sit, and we redesign it together so that they can experience it. And I do that over and over and over again with people from different groups until, in theory, we have an experience that most people can do. In your world, this is a bit harder, I would assume. But also what this means is designing with your users. Your users are experts in what goes wrong in the thing you make. They know exactly where all the problems are. They know exactly where all the wonderful things that you didn't realize are great. If you invite them to the table when you're building requirements, if you invite them to the table for that very first test that you really don't want anyone to ever see, if you invite them to the table when you are coding, you might just end up with a better product. And that's what co-design suggests as a methodology. Idealistically, it means we bring them to the table and we get something better because they will see an angle that I could never see. Um, yeah. Does anyone have any questions on those two bits? No. Wonderful. All right. Why do I do this for accessibility research? Um, so, inside accessibility, I my two my two main fields of study um, are disability studies and the study of museums. For context, I tech brings them together uh, in that I do mixed reality for both of those things. Uh, mixed reality, that's a really good question. I forget that I talk about it so much that other people don't know what it is. Uh, mixed reality is anything from, did you play Pokemon Go on your phone a couple years ago? Okay. Uh, it's anything from having, like, s an, it's a virtual object on your phone positioned in physical space. So if you walked around it, the object wouldn't move or rotate because it's fixed, but you're seeing it through your phone to VR headsets where you're fully immersed in a virtual world. So it's the mixing of virtual and real. Um, it kind of acts in similar ways to ubiquitous computing, which is computing that is everywhere. So watches, phones, all of that kind of overlap. Um, but yeah. <laughs> um, yes, question. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 this is fine. Um, so the question was, is it another way of saying augmented reality? And the answer is no, but kind of. Um, so augmented reality, when mixed reality is also sometimes known as extended reality, right, as overview. Under that, what we have is augmented reality, which is virtual, the virtual world coming into the physical world. So that objects that you can move around with your phone, augmented reality. Um, the HoloLens headsets, augmented reality, because you can see through them, you can see the real world, you're still in the real world. Um, I'm going to skip one of the options because it's complicated. And then you have full virtuality is the main alternative. So you'll sometimes see it written as AR slash VR. Virtuality is the full headsets. So you can't see the real world. You are supposed to be totally immersed in the virtual world and it only breaks when you walk into something. Um, the one in the middle, by the way, is when the real world uh, ends up interrupting the virtual world. So full virtual headset, but you can see something in the real world. And it's, that one is weird. <laughs> but back to true methods. Um, that side, very vague side time was to say, I don't do tech that is normally seen at this conference. Tech is also not my main focus. Uh, I'm far more interested in people. Um, but the reason we use partition methods for accessibility is that it centers lived experience. Um, and it also fits really nicely with the disability quote, nothing about us without us, which is disabled people are being asked to be at the table, to be involved in the conversations. Don't tell us what we need. Let us tell you what we need. Um, in research, it prevents minority communities being lab rats, observed and othered more by the research community. Um, this still happens in research. 
I read a lot of research where it's a problem. And also the last point, everyone is an expert in their own lives. You all know your own lives better than anybody else can. You all know the problems you face in your own lives better than anybody else can. So why would I ask somebody else when I have people who have incredible expertise in the problem better than anyone else can? You might not know why it's what happened, but I don't care about the why. I care about the how. Um, so this is kind of why we use it here. I think this should map roughly onto why I think all of you should do participatory design in what you do, please. Um, <laughs> it's because it, in theory, centers your users. It centers the people who actually, hopefully, need the thing you're making or can tell you that it's a waste of time and you should stop. Um, and if you bring them in completely from the start, what we tend to find in research when this is done is that there are less iterations and the end result tends to be better. Um, and you also will, may find less scope creep because they're in at the beginning and you say, well, this is what we can do. And when they're with you on the journey, they can't go, they can say, oh, can you add this thing? And that's part of the conversation. It's not suddenly a, you produce a demo and they're like, oh, actually, we want these 10 more things. It's as you go along, they can be like, that feature's really nice, but actually what we need is this. So you don't develop the thing you don't need. Right. Here are some closing thoughts. And I am running under by a bit. Oh, no. OK. Not by as much as I thought. Um, so some closing thoughts. There is going to be a lot of time for questions uh, at the end. But accessibility guidelines are there to be a minimum requirement. But please use them as the minimum requirement. You should actually vaguely know what ones are out there. I understand for some of you the answer is going to be there's not many. I, I'm sorry. I'll let you know when I find some. Microsoft almost certainly have some somewhere, maybe. Uh, but I will go double check that. Um, accessibility is also a journey, not an end goal. I am not expecting anything anybody makes in the next ooh, five to 10 years to be accessible for absolutely every single person on the planet. That's not a viable goal. What I'm asking is you to make it more accessible to your current users. And if you get a new type of user, to work with them to make it better. Uh, the last point is to talk to disabled people. We're normally really friendly. Um, and also people with additional access requirements. The reason both are there is that I know some people who would not consider themselves disabled and yet need things that will help them. Um, so I use the language they use about themselves. But please talk to them. If you have a question and you're like, mm, I don't know how the screen reader thing works, go find a screen reader user. Because they will know, and they'll be normally more than happy to show you, especially if you're like, well, I'm making it better for this reason. I want to know for this reason. Um, the caveat to that is if someone doesn't want to, please don't. Like, they have the choice to say, I don't have the energy for that. Um, but in terms of learning more, there are some places. Uh, so if you want to do accessibility as part of your job long term, please join the International Association of Accessibility Professionals. Um, they do some really cool stuff, and they have some qualifications to show you that you know what you that you know what you know. Um, they have web specific ones, document specific ones, and a general and a physical uh, building specific one. Um, W3C's Web Accessibility Initiative have a course uh, that is completely free, unless you want a certificate, at which point it's ninety nine dollars to help them pay for the course. Um, and if you do any sort of education at all and you want to make your learning resources more accessible, Teach Access do a bunch of courses about that. Uh, so these are some of the places that I learn more. This, yeah, this is the slide to take pictures of. This is the real important one. <laughs> so one last any questions. That's a really quiet room. Come on, guys. There must be something. Yeah, I can talk about my research all the day, all the time. It's my favorite thing to do. Uh, so I uh, work um, to, uh, at the moment, we're studying a couple of different things. Um, but 
the kind of research projects I'm working on at the moment, uh, I'm going to have to be a bit vague because it's still ongoing research. It's not going to be published for a while. Um, is that there the National Holocaust uh, Center and Museum a couple years ago did an exhibit called The Eye as Witness, which is a virtual reality exhibit where you step into a photograph from Nazi Germany. And it's there to make you think about who is the photographer of a lot of these photographs we see and think about uh, how that, that photographer was normally part of the SS. Uh, and so I'm researching how they did the design for that exhibit, hopefully, um, talking to a lot of the designers in retrospect about what they included, what they think the problems were. Uh, and then another piece of work I'm also doing with that museum, well, hopefully doing with that museum, is that I visited an exhibit called I Say British, You Say Jewish a couple of weeks ago uh, as just a normal member of the public, walked in, did my thing, just observed. Uh, and then at the moment, we don't know this is going to be publishable, but I'm writing it up as a piece of research, as a uh, both a reflection of my experience as like diary, but also then analyzing that uh, and the way they use tech and the way they designed it and how accessible that felt um, as a disabled adult, how I felt in that room uh, to kind of help them hopefully create some new processes for designing for accessibility because currently they have a checklist that they use and not much else. Um, but yeah, so that's that's the current research projects I'm doing. But I, yeah, I'm doing a lot of participatory. So we're hopefully going to be working with some disabled people to do some design of research, uh, of museum exhibits, or at least bits of installations um, over the next couple of years. I'm very early on. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's a brief overview. Any, any questions, either about that or about anything I've said? Uh, accessibility checkers, are they any good? I think they're not the worst. Um, <laughs> which I know is a very diplomatic answer. Uh, and I think I'm going to keep it as a very diplomatic answer. Um, the thing I would say about them is they are very standardized. And from what I remember of a lot of them, very screen reader heavy. So they will tell you about col color contrast and some other visual things, but a lot of accessibility at the moment is can a screen reader do this? And like obviously that's a big inaccessibility issue, but it doesn't necessarily, on certain apps, it doesn't think about is this button big enough all the time? It doesn't think about have you put these two things too close together? Can you actually see them separately? Um, so they're good at what they do, but they do not necessarily cover everything, is what I would say. Uh, I'm willing to be proven wrong by other users, but also I know the Microsoft team that made them, like made the Microsoft ones, are all disabled people. Um, so they, what they have done is what they need. So they, I will give that those are very good. There are gaps in what they could do. Um, and there's always going to be gaps. So, yes. So there isn't a database of personas. It doesn't exist. Uh, this is a question that was asked in a research setting recently. There is not a database of them. Some researchers have banks of ones they've made. There are some that are published. But if they're not open access, you won't be able to get to them. Um, there is a middle ground between personas and co-design. Uh, which is a bit of a weird spot. So one of the things uh, I will be doing is working with uh, disabled people to understand their access needs so that when I can't be in constant communication with them, I have a rough profile of this person and what they have told me is specifically what they need. So I can look out for it. And if I spot it, I can go, I think here is potentially a problem for them. And I have a person I can go ask and be like, did I get this right? And so you can kind of start to learn what other people's access needs are-ish. So that kind of blending of if there is a person you know who has the access needs that you are thinking about, um, and you can work with them to build a kind of template of what they need, want, and should see, that's really like that's the best middle ground you can get if they can't be there with you 
to be that bit more involved. Yep. Specifically for accessibility. There is a ton out there for not accessibility. <laughs> Um, I work with uh, one of my colleagues, does uh, data, doesn't do data visualization, does infographics, I think is what she's actually researching. Um, and like I talk to her all the time and she's like, oh my gosh, there's so much data visualization stuff in tech about really specific, this is when you should use this visualization. But there is a lot less, you've got to go into design research to really find out the, what narratives are you telling what is can a person actually understand this so it's a weird research scape because it's all very narrow and boxed in a bit of a weird way um one of the reasons i do interdisciplinary is to get out some of those boxes um so one of the things that me and this friend are both researching is we're both doing uh design-based research uh she's doing design fictions and i'm doing uh, co-design. So design fiction is where you make up the fake worlds um, and she's using that to create infographics about uh, to help make that world exist. So she looks at food systems um, and so what I'd say is you should be it's a little bit more holistic when you look at it from a design point of view. You think about the colors you're using and you think about the story you're telling by where it is on the page. That's still an accessibility thing in some ways because it reduces the cognitive load when you make it really easy for your users to be like, ah, oh, this is where I'm going next. Um, so yeah, it's yeah, it's a be a bit broader. Use design principles. Really, I should have my design researcher friend here, and she'd be able to be like telling you all about it. But it's not my discipline. <laughs> is there any any other questions? Yes. What's the key to how to do that? So. Okay, so the question was about flow charts and how to make them accessible on a website, in short. Okay, uh, my, I think my first question back would be, does your flow chart change? Is it, uh, if you click on something else on the website, will the flow chart change or is it a static picture? It's a static picture. Then I think alt text can be the right answer, but what you're not doing is saying this is a flow chart of this. What you need to do is talk them, almost talk them through the flow chart. So imagine, the way I think about alt text is if I have a screen here and you can't see it, what am I telling you I'm seeing? Mm -hmm. um, so the rat that is in the middle of there, I know that alt text almost off by heart because that is uh, a rat that is all over my website. Um, and he is a little rat holding a dagger with a uh, navy blue cape with his tail knocking over a bucket. I don't know if you can see that particularly well, but that is exactly what that rat is doing. Um, but hopefully you now have a picture of this rat in your mind, even if you can't see him. And that is what alt text is there for. Does that make sense? Beautiful. Please do some feedback. We have some time. If you have not done it. Oh, beautiful. Okay, I won't. Uh, also, my link tree is here. If you want to find me, find my website. I talk about disability and being a disabled person in the real world and sometimes how awful it is and sometimes how great it is. Um, what a link tree is. Oh, a link tree. It is, if you scan that QR code, you will go to a little website that has links to all my different things. So on it, you can find my website. I think my Twitter is on there, though that's not particularly used very much. It's used a little bit. Um, on there, you can find uh, the research highlights. So my, uh, the place, uh, the CDT, has a website and on there is a bit where I tell you what my research is, that is linked. Um, I can't remember what else I put on there. Oh, you can email me. That's the other really important bit. <laughs> uh, is my email is on there. So if you wanna get in contact with me privately uh, or my LinkedIn, email or LinkedIn are probably the best ways to get in contact if you have any extra questions. All right, thank you all for coming. Uh, do reach out if you've got any questions.